So the last part will be the final conclusion. And uh, if time permits, I will sketch the proof. Okay, so in this talk, if you are not familiar with those complex ge uh, geometric terms, so for torsion-free coherent shift, uh, you can view it as holomorphic vector bundles uh, with singularities. Uh, the singular set will be sub varieties of co-dimension at least two. So, so you can take the ideal shift of a point, for example. So coherent just means that uh, they behave well near the singular set. Uh, so for re reflexive shift, uh, you can view them as holomorphic vector bundles uh, with co-dimension three singularities. And a good property that it has satisfied, it has satisfied this uh, Hartle's extension property. Uh, a good example can be given by this one. So you take three functions, Z1, Z2, Z3, and you have a map, then you take the kernel. So as you can see, this map has a zero at the origin. So um, this E where it has an essential singularity at the point origin, rather than that, it will just be smooth holomorphic vector bundle. So based on the definition, you know that uh, this kind of uh, torsion-free coherent shift uh, or reflexive coherent shifts, they only appear when your base dimension is at least two for torsion free shift and at least three for reflexive shifts. And also to go from the category of torsion free shift to the category of uh, reflexive shift, uh, you can just take the home shift from this shift E to the structure shift. Uh, this will uh, give you a reflexive shift. And uh, a shift is the reflexive shift just means that if you take the home shift twice, you recover itself. So these are some elementary properties. So basically you can view them as holomorphic vector bundles uh, with uh, controlled singularities. So that's the meaning. Okay, so these are just some uh, concepts. Uh, given this, uh, let's recall the donaldson wollenberg yau theorem. It says, suppose you have a holomorphic vector bundle over a compact Taylor manifold. The theorem says that uh, if you know this E is slope stable, then there exists a Hermitian Young mass metric H on this E. So by a Hermitian Young mass metric, just means that you take the curvature of the chain connection determined by this H. Now you look at the contraction of the Kähler form uh, of this curvature. It will be a multiple of the identity map. And this mu here uh, is a constant. So this is the equation. Uh, let me define what is the meaning of the slope stability. So it means that uh, if you look at all the sub bundles with singularities, now you can compute the average of the first chain class uh, by doing integration with respect to the Kähler form. So it will be strictly smaller than the slope of the ambient shift E. So uh, in this case, we call the bundle to be slope stable. Well, what's if the you first have a so, yes, so I was wondering what the first churn class of a sheaf is. How does one define uh, that? I know what so, the sh first churn class of a bundle is, but not the other sheaf. Yeah. So as I said, uh, so the definition is can be given as follows actually. So uh, this shift E uh, is a, a vector bundle outside of outside the co-dimension two sub variety. Right. So you can define a determinant there. And actually you can show that this determinant can be extended to be the to be defined over the whole space. So you get a genuine line bundle. We define the first chain class to be that one. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, slope stability. 
Uh, now, uh, in literature, the chain connection involved in this theorem is usually referred as hermitian Young's connection. And actually, just by using the Kähler identity, you know that uh, hermitian Young actually implies uh, a character to be harmonic. So it's indeed a Young Mills connection. Uh, so this is uh, Donaldson Wollenbeck Yau theorem. Uh, later, this, this was generalized by Bando and Sue to the case of uh, stable reflexive sheaves by using the so called admissible Hermitian Young Mills metric. As I mentioned earlier, uh, reflexive sheaves are bundles uh, with co dimension three singularities. So when you talk about the Hermitian Young Mills connection, so it is just defined away from the singular set of the bundle, but at the same time, uh, the character, the L2 norm of the character has to be finite. Uh, so this is the so-called admissible Hermitian Young Mills metric. Uh, let me give you a genuine example of a stable reflexive sheaf uh, that is not a holomorphic vat bundle. So you consider uh, this sheaf E of CP3. So basically you take three uh, sections of the hyperplane bundle. Now you take the quotient of this one, uh, this will be rank two, and this E uh, will has an isolated singularity given by the zero of this one. And one can check that uh, this E is actually a stable reflexive shift um, by using some algebraic geometric criteria. So by bundle on the seal theorem, uh, theoretically we know that uh, there exists a single hermitian yamas connection on this E. Uh, so this is bundle on seal theorem. Uh, let me give you a, a, a few remarks here. So bundle on seal theorem implies theoretical ex existence of singular hermitian yamas connections. And for giving explicit examples, the local information of the singular set can be usually described by using resolutions like uh, this one, like we just did with this one. So algebraically, we know how to describe the singularity. And also this kind of singular connections uh, naturally appear on the boundary if you compactify the modular space of hermitian young connections on a given unitary bundle. And this kind of singular, this kind of uh, the appearance of this kind of singular connections uh, make the compactification very difficult. So uh, what is the meaning of that? So uh, if you uh, assume the base dimension is uh, three, now if you look at all these kind of singular connections on the boundary, uh, because it is singular, so the singular point, uh, so the singular set will consist of points. So basically the difficulty, difficulty lies in, you don't have control of the number of uh, the points of the singular points of the boundary. So yeah, you don't know how to compactify the singular connection in this case, because uh, topology can be very complicated. So the question that we ask about this is that how does those singular connections behave uh, near the essential singularities? And it only appear non-trivially when your base dimension is at least two, is at least three. Because in dimension two, we have uh, Wollenbeck's removable singularity. Uh, let me give, you, give a few motivation for asking this question. Uh, originally, this is motivated by Donaldson and Sun's work on singularities of a Kähler Einstein matrix. Uh, the second motivation is that it helps understand the compatibility of modular space of Hermitian Young's connections that I just described. And this modular space usually carries rich geometry in general and has very important applications. Uh, one of the famous applications is Donaldson's non vanishing theorem uh, when the base dimension is two. Uh, about the compatibility of the modular space. So a good description only exists uh, when the base projective 
And uh, uh, when the base dimension is two, this is uh, due to Li Jun. In higher dimension, it's due to Grab, Sibley, Toma, and Richard. And so in this case, the um, algebraic geometry comes in in a very essential way. Because in that case, like uh, what I said, they can control the number of singular points, like uh, in the examples that I just described. Another motivation for us to, un to ask this question is, it provides a model case for studying gauge theory over manifolds uh, with special holonomy, like G2 spin seven. Okay, now let me talk about the local model that we will focus on. So first, we fix a reflexive shift, a bundle with uh, uh, co-dimension three singularities uh, of the unit ball. Now we fix a Kähler metric so that it can be written in this way. This omega zero is a, is a standard flat metric. Now on this shift E, we fix an admissible Hamishian metric and a connection on E. So that means that the connection, if you define at least shift E and also the Hamishian equation, the last one is that you uh, want to have control of the L2 norm of the character. Uh, so here we can simply mention this A without E because um, this E is actually is uh, exactly defined by A. Uh, to study such type of singularity, uh, the information we get can be divided into three parts. Uh, one is uh, analytical information that you can get from the connection A and the metric. Uh, the second part is uh, algebraic information that you can get from just as a shift E itself. So the last part will be to use the at break to characterize the analytical information. Uh, let's look at how we get the analytical information. So this is a process through zooming in. Uh, what does that mean? So basically you just uh, rescale the base, uh, rescale the base manifold to be CN. At the same time, you can rescale your connection and take a limit. Let, let me make it a little bit more precise. You fix a lambda positive number. Now you can define a rescaling map of the base in this way. Uh, through this rescaling map, you can pull back your admissible hamishin yamas connection and you get a new one. Now by letting this uh, lambda go to zero, uh, passing to a subsequence, this is very important. Now up to some gate transforms, you can forget about the terms. So this is used to guarantee the convergence. After you do this, all these things, you can take the limit of uh, this sequence of A lambda. So the limit now lives on CN with the standard flat matrix. So a sequence of A lambda will give you a limiting pair, A infinity sigma B. I will make it more precise later. But right now, you can just view them as a pair. This A infinity is a connection. Sigma B is a sub variety of this uh, CN, and uh, they have very good, prop, uh, good structure. So roughly, this piece of information uh, comes from the follows. The part where we have smooth convergence uh, the other part is uh, we don't have smooth convergence. So this is the information we get. And the key ingredient that we used here is the price simultaneity formula. Uh, so this formula will tell you that for this uh, um, sequence of rescaled connections, you have auto control of the curvature over any compact uh, subset of CN. So in this case, you can apply the known analytical result to get a limit. So let me make it a, a little bit more precise about the limiting pair. So this A infinity 
is an admit for Hamishin Yama's connection on CN. And uh, this sigma B in literature is usually called the blow up locus. Actually, this is named by Tian. And it will help you memorize the loss of Yang Mir's energy in the following way. So as a sequence of currents, uh, if you look at the chain two defined by A lambda, uh, if you look at the limit of this one, it will differ the chain two by this A infinity. Uh, the difference is given by a integer linear com uh, combination of this uh, of uh, sub varieties of CN of pure code machine two. And uh, this MK uh, is an integer that can be associated to each irreducible component of sigma k. So it is called the analytical multiplicity. And uh, this, uh, this kind of structure theorem is uh, due to TN. And also uh, using price modernities formula, TN actually shows that uh, this A infinity sigma B are pulled back from the projective space. So what does that mean? That means that uh, uh, from CN, you take away from the origin, there is a natural map to the projective space. Now this A infinity sigma B is just uh, the pullback of some data over this projective space. And the connection part, you need to do some elementary modifications to make things work. And the sigma B adjusts the closure of the inverse image of the sub varieties of PN. They are all pure code dimension two. Okay, so the conclusion that we can draw is that uh, this A infinity sigma B is at break. And we call this pair to be an analytical tangent cone of uh, the admissible Hamishin Yama's connection at the origin. And uh, there are two fundamental questions about this. The first one is the uniqueness. Uh, because as I said earlier, this depends on the choice of uh, subsequence if you want to get a limit tangent cone. The second question is, suppose you know uniqueness, how is it related to the initial data? Like how does it depend on the data E and A? So those are two fundamental questions that we are going to answer in this talk. So the main results that we got for this is, for, is as follows. So the analytical tangent cone turns out can be uniquely determined by E. So what does that mean? That means that if you have two admits for Hermitian Young Mills connection that defines, that defines the same E, the tangent cones will be the same. So that being said, we know that uh, this tangent cone is an algebraic invariant associated to this E. Uh, let me introduce the first theorem that we got in 2017 and 2018 in the case of uh, homogeneous isolated singularity. So now we assume that locally, we already know that away from the origin, the shift E is a pullback of a holomorphic vector bundle over the projective space. So in this case, uh, the analytical tangent cone will be uniquely determinant by all canonical filtrations of this uh, holomorphic vector bundle E, the so-called Hada Narasimha Sashadri filtrations. Uh, uh, let me give a remark here. So when uh, this underlying E is polystable, uh, this is proved by Jacob Waposki style using a PD, or PD approach, because in this case, uh, by assumptions, since this underlying E is the direct sum of uh, stable bundles, so you can construct a smooth Hermitian Yamis cone type connection just by using Donaldson Wurmbeck Yau theorem. Now, using this uh, a specific cone, 
it can be used to compare with unknown ones, and you can get a higher order PDE estimate. So the uniqueness is just a conclusion. Uh, but in general, uh, such a cone uh, with a smooth link uh, does not exist, just uh, as our theorem indicates, because the tangent cone can have essential singularities. This is why we need to work a lot harder at that time. Okay, let me introduce the term that I used here. Uh, the first one is a so-called hardener Sigman filtration. So this is a unique canonical filtration associated to a bundle or more generally to a torsion-free sheaf. So it is a filtration consists of uh, sub bundles with singularities. Uh, let's uh, look at the first factor. I will only define that one because other factors will be similar. So uh, the first factor can be defined as uh, the sheaf that de destabilizes at least E in a maximal sense. Maximal just means that both in rank and slope. So this will give you a unique subsheaf. This is how you define E1. And then similarly, you can define this E2 quotient E1 for this E quotient E1. In this case, you get E2 and keep going. So in particular, just by definition, we know that if you look at the graded factors, they are all semi-stable, torsion-free. And uh, if you look at the slope of uh, this graded factor, they all strictly decreases. And uh, this, is, this filtration is unique. Uh, to understand our theorem, we need to introduce another filtration, the so-called hardener siemens shadri filtration. So basically, you just need to add more factors to the first hardener siemens filtration. Let's talk about, again, talk about this first factor. So you, uh, you add the first factor E11 to be a stable torsion-free, and it has the same slope as this E1. Then similarly, you do induction to define the remaining factors. But here, this first factor E11, uh, the choice is not unique. You have more than one choice in general. But uh, based on this hardener siemens shadri filtration, uh, we know that the graded factors are all stable and the slope of the graded factors is non-increasing. So these are properties we, we might need, we will need. Now, we given the HNS filtration, you can take the graded shift associated to this one. This will be a direct sum of torsion-free shift. So it will be bundles uh, with co-dimension two singularities. Now for this one, you can define a quotient sheaf that looks like this, the W quotient of the original one. This sheaf will be only supported on the singularities of this graded sheaf. So that means that supported on a co-dimension two sub-variety. So from this, uh, we can extract a canonical algebraic, algebraic data as follows. One is the W of this sheaf, you take home twice to make it a reflexive. The other one is a linear combination of this um, pure co-dimension two support of this tau. And uh, there is an algebraic way to associate a uh, multiplicity to each irreducible component. And I will not um, talk about it here, but I will use an example to explain. The only information you need to know is that you can extract a canonical algebraic data uh, from the HNS filtration. Uh, so the conclusion that our first theorem basically says that uh, the graded, at least W of the graded sheaf plus the algebraic cycle you got will determine this A infinity and sigma B in an elementary way. So sigma B will be the inverse image of this C tau 
at infinity, if you look at the shift it defines, it will be isomorphic to the pullback of this one. So that's our conclusion. Let me give you an example where it can be applied. Uh, again, you consider a rank two uh, reflector shift, a rank two bundle with sing essential singularities given as follows. Uh, obviously three, you take three holomorphic functions, Z1, Z2, Z3 square. Now this uh, section has a zero at the origin. So the quotient shift again, where has a singular singularity at a point origin. And one can show this E is actually reflexive. So the, uh, the origin is uh, an essential singularity. Uh, we fix A to be any admissible Hermitian EMS connection on this E. And one can show they exist a lot of them. Just based on this uh, resolution description, we can easily see that this E is a pullback of this underlying E that lies in the following exact sequence. And this underlying E, as we can see, is a homomorphic vector bundle because this one has no zero uh, over the projected space. So in this case, we, we can apply our first theorem. So to apply that, we need to take a hard and Sachardry filtration. But for this one, the filtration can be easily chosen to be as follows. You can take this O2 factor, it maps to this E. Now the quotient shift, uh, a simple calculation will show that it will be the ideal shift of a point and tensor O2. So that's how you get uh, the filtration. Now, based on this filtration, you take the gradient shift. Uh, it will be the first factor O2 directs on the last factor. So this is a piece of information that you get from the filtration. Now, what is the process to determine the uh, analytic tangent cone? So to determine that, you just first take the W of this gradient shift it will be a direct sum of O2 plus O2. Now the grid W of this gradient shift uh, with itself, as you can see, it will be just be this O2 quotient of this ideal shift P times O2. So in this case, we know that the support of this uh, torsion shift of this one is given by the point P. And uh, just based on the W of this one, the elementary modification that be that that will be used will tell us that this A infinity is actually flat, and the blow up locus will be the line through the origin given by this point P. So in this case, the the structure of the tangent cone is clear, and we get a flat connection in the limit. So from this, this example, we actually know that uh, the tangent cone connection A infinity can be smooth and does not capture the original singularity. And in general, uh, there exist abundant examples uh, where this shift E is not pulled back from the projected space. You can look at this E to be the kernel given by uh, this section. You choose three sections and three functions given as this one. And uh, one can show that this E is not, it's not homogeneous in this case by studying a notion of uh, fitting ID. So given this, uh, in order to solve the problem in general, uh, we, we need to find something like at least on the line E in our first case. And indeed, this is true. So this is a theorem that we got uh, in 2018. So how do we get the canonical algebraic geometric data? Uh, let me briefly explain. So here's the approach. Uh, 
Uh, now our sheaf live on this uniboard B. Um, to get something over the projected space, the natural thing to do is to blow up at the origin so that you replace the origin of the B with a copy of uh, the projective space, PM minus one, the exceptional divisor. Now we look at the space of all possible reflexive extensions of this sheaf of the puncture ball across this PM minus one. So that's a thing we will focus on. Uh, the point is, if you start with a given reflexive extension, as if uh, originally, if the restriction of that extension to the exceptional divisor, oh, sorry, this should be PM minus one. If the restriction to the exceptional divisor is not close to being same stable. So that means that if you think it is not good, now we can modify it along the exceptional divisor to get another extension. It turns out if we modify it in a certain way, it will reduce the error of the extension from being semi-stable. So repeating this process, eventually you will end up with an object that is uh, closest from being semi-stable. And that, that is the data uh, we can use to characterize uh, the analytic tangent cone in general. I will, I will make it more precise later. But now uh, the extension closest from being sam stable will be called an um, optimal algebraic tangent cone of this sheaf at a point origin. And the conclusion is that uh, this is unique up to some special modifications that we can easily keep track of. Uh, let me make it more precise. So first we need to, we need an error function that mirrors how good an extension is. So for a given extension, you take the uh, hard and Narasimha filtration. Now the error function will just be the slope of the first factor E1 minus the slope of the last factor. So in this case, we call a reflexive extension to be optimal, that is uh, the closest from being same stable. If you look at the error function, it lies between zero and one, a strictly less than one. And of course, I should remark that if your error function is zero, that means that your restriction is semi-stable. And, uh, but a semi-stable extension does not always exist in general. And the modification that I used in this process is called the Hackey transform it is uh, defined as follows. If you fix a reflexive extension E hat, you can take any saturated subsheaf of this online E hat. Uh, there is a natural map from your E hat to this uh, torsion free sheaf. Like in this case, if your underline F is zero, this is basically the restriction map. Now through this map, you can take the kernel of this A hat prime. And then one can show that this is a, a new reflexive extension. You can usually see it is an extension just by definition because uh, uh, this only change the information of this E hat. Oh, what, sorry, this, oh, this will preserve the information away from the exceptional device, right? Because uh, the modification is supported on PM minus one. So special hacky transform just means that uh, for this underline F, when you want to apply, use it to apply the modification, you choose F to be any factor in the hard and Narasimha filtration of this E hat, of this restriction. And the uniqueness of the more optimal ones is up to a special, special hacky transfer. So roughly speaking, the picture is you start with something really bad, probably, then you keep applying this kind of special hacky transform, it will reduce the error eventually after finding many steps. Now, if you keep applying special hacky transform, it will uh, be optimal always. 
So for that object, we call it to be optimal. And since it is, uh, since this kind of optimal ones differ by special Hacking transform, this property will tell us that we can just extract a canonical algebraic data just as before. That is, you take an optimal algebraic tangent con E hat, you can take a hard and racima Schadwell filtration of this restriction. Again, you take the graded shift associated to this uh, hard and racima Schadwell filtration. You take the W, an algebraic way tell you to get a linear combination of Q pure convention two sub varieties. So it does not depend on the choice of optimal algebraic tangent cone. It is uniquely determined by E. So let's. Uh, information that we get from E as a algebraic geometric invariants. Okay, so given this, we are ready to uh, state the final result. So that is, suppose you have an admissible hamishin yang mass connection on a reflexive shift E over the ball B. Now the conclusion says that the analytical tangent cone of A as the origin is uniquely determined by the optimal algebraic tangent cones of E as the origin. Uh, so the way to determine that is just similar as our first theorem. So in particular, we know that the analytical tangent cone is an algebraic invariant associated to this uh, shift E. Uh, let me briefly sketch the proof. So the strategy to prove this is uh, study the so-called rescaled limits of sections of this shift E. And this is uh, motivated by Donaldson and Swin's work on Kähler Einstein matrix, uh, where they studied the rescaled limits of uh, holomorphic functions. Uh, the key difference here is that Compared to the study of Kähler Einstein metric, uh, we don't have the so called Homando technique. And also, we know just from our results that not all the sections of the tangent cone comes from the rescale limits. So, you would not expect that you can prove some L2 estimate for all the sections. So we don't have commander technique for general sections. That's the main difficulty in our case. Uh, let me briefly explain what does that mean by studying the rescale limits of the sections of E. Uh, if you fix a section S of this shift E, uh, through this rescaling map, you can pull back your section. Now you can normalize the R2 norm of this section of the ball to be one. Of course, this will give you a sequence of homomorphic sections that has uniform, uh, that has L2 norm equal to one of the ball. And the standard elliptic theory tells you that you can indeed take a limit because they satisfy elliptic equations. But the technical difficulty is that because our base it's just a ball. So the limit might be trivial. So that's a difficult, that's a difficulty. So eventually the section might concentrate near the boundary and you get a zero. That does not tell you any information. So to overcome this, uh, there is a notion of convexity similar to the Kähler Einstein case. It says, suppose you have a section S of this shift E. If you know that the degree, that is um, the matching order of this section at, at the origin with respect to the unknown metric, it's finite. Once you know this number is finite, the rescale limit of this S will be non-trivial. And also it will be pulled back from the projective space because as I said, our connection A infinity are pulled back from the projective space. So as long as you, you know your number, uh, this degree is finite, you know that the limit section is also pulled back from the projective space. 
Okay, so so in order to get the non-trivial limits, we need to control uh, this number. And the key observation that we got is that this uh, in this degree is always finite, no matter what kind of section you choose at the beginning. So indeed, you always get a non-trivial holomorphic, uh, non-trivial limits for any given section. Uh, based on this, this enables us to solve the problem intrinsically compared to our first theorem in the homogeneous case. Uh, the approach that we did in this case is that uh, here we started with some unknown homogeneous Yamas connections. As I said, its degree function is always finite. So we have a degree function D that comes out of uh, this uh, metric H. Now using this D, we can do algebraic construction to get an optimal algebraic tangent cone E hat of this E at the origin. So in particular, starting with an unknown hermitian Yamas connection, we can construct uh, some intrinsic optimal algebraic tangent cone associated to the unknown hermitian Yamas connection. Uh, because uh, this is intrinsically associated to the metric H, the shape E, the A, we can then use at least uh, one to characterize the analytic tangent cone. Uh, so this is uh, Yes. So, so is E hat generated by those those limit sections? Is that uh, E hat is uh, E hat lives on this B hat. So, yeah. so it's uh, it's really just an extension of E. Uh, it's not an, it's not in the limit. It's just in the place at the beginning before you take the limit. Okay. Yes. So it's an optimal attribute tangent. So the upshot is that uh, this degree function is a well-defined function. Uh, this part we already know based on the observation. The non-trivial part is that it satisfies enough good algebraic properties so that we can construct some optimal ones. Um, I will explain the construction a little bit more. So for simplicity in the following, I will always assume that the degree function is a fixed number modulo the integer z. Uh, actually, this corresponds to the assumption that the optimal tangent cone is actually semi stable. The general case can be dealt with uh, similarly. Uh, step one let's construct a shift over this uh, projective space. Uh, how do we do the construction? Now we uh, define this MK to be the space of sections that has degree strictly bigger equal to mu plus K. So if this gives us a space, now we can take the gradient module as follows. This MK quotient MK plus one, then you take direct sum. And the technical point is to show that uh, this gradient shift uh, sorry, this gradient module is a finitely generated torsion free gradient module of the ring of uh, homogeneous polynomials. And in particular, it defines a torsion free coherent shift of the projective space. And uh, actually, this finite generated property really comes from the fact that we already know the tangent cone is algebraic plus. Uh, some technical difficulty involved, involved with the degree function. We can show that. And this is the technical point that we overcame in the paper. So after you get this, you can get a, you can define a torsion free shift. It's the underlying E hat. And at this point, we don't know, we don't even know what is the rank of this shift actually. Uh, during this process, uh, there is an analytical tackling point that I want to point out. So, uh, so because uh, just imagine if you start with uh, two sections and uh, do this rescaling process, 
it might happen that these two sections, if you do convergence, if they converge to the same thing, when you do rescaling, so the angle becomes zero, you get one section. So in order to overcome this, we need to do uh, this grand schmidt orthomalization so that you, during this process, you want to orthomalize the two sections. But again, the difficulty is that you don't know uh, whether you can get a non-trivial limits after you do this orthomalization. So that's a difficulty we overcame. Also, even you know that uh, you get a non-trivial limit, you don't know the degree of the limit section. So this is a, a technical point, a really technical point that we need to deal with. Excuse me. So after you, after that, the next technical point is that since we already constructed something of the exceptional divisor, the next step is to construct a, an extension of E hat so that it really restricted to the uh, shape that you construct on the exceptional divisor. So in particular, we know that the shape we construct has a rank, has a good rank equal to the rank of the original shape. And during this process, again, uh, the reflective property of the extension uh, is very technical. So after you have done the construction, we, we basically get an extension of this E. And uh, based on our assumption, there is one thing we need to show. We need to show it is optimal. So that means in this case, because our assumption, we need to show that it is semi-stable. And to solve this, uh, in this case, it really comes from the fact that not just this E, we can also do a construction related to the dual of this shift E. Like uh, if you look at the admissible hamishin yamas connection associated to the a dual shift, like uh, the dual of this bundle, you can get a construction. Now you do pairing of that one, it will tell you the information about the semi-stability. So again, this is a non-technical point. And of course, without assuming that the degree is a fixed number modular the integer, uh, this process can only give us an optimal algebraic tangent cone. So let's uh, construction. Eventually, we we'll end up with something optimal, intrinsic, associated to this shape E. OK, now we can finish the proof using this intrinsic uh, uh, optimal algebraic tangent cone. So by the construction, if you start with a shift S of this shift E, it can be naturally identified with the section S hat of this uh, optimal algebraic tangent cone, but it has certain vanishing order along the exceptional divisor determined by the degree. So indeed, if you start with section S, you get something algebraic over the exceptional divisor. So the rough idea is that when you take the analytical limits of this uh, section S, you can also take the algebraic limit of this S hat at the same time. Uh, since in this case, our E hat, our restriction is semi-stable, let's look at the two pieces of information that we get. So analytical side, uh, you have limits of the rescaled sections that are homogeneous pull back from the projective space and help you detect the uh, analytical shift defined by this A infinity. On the algebraic side, so when you do this uh, Grand Schmidt optimization, at the same time, you did something to the corresponding algebraic sections when you do restriction to the exceptional divisor. So basically, you get a sequence of elements uh, in, the, in a certain code scheme given by this uh, restriction shift. Now, uh, on the algebraic side, because uh, this lives in a code scheme, by passing to a subsequence, you can actually take a limit, take an algebraic limit of this QI. That will give you an algebraic limit Q infinity. 
but uh, in general, uh, the limits you get in the code scheme is can be very, very bad. Like uh, you don't know what it is. So the naive idea is that since you get an analytic limit, you also get an algebraic limit. So just uh, you want to connect them. So you want to identify them. Uh, indeed, this is true. So, but um, very technical because um, we are working with different base. One is the exceptional divisor, one is a uh, bow. So we want to connect at least two limits. It turns out, even though it is technical, but it is true, the identification of the algebraic and the analytic sections can help you realize the following. You can realize this uh, algebraic limit you get as a torsion free coherent shift, coherent subshift of this analytic one. So indeed, you, your algebraic limit can detect a lot of information of the analytic one. And furthermore, uh, this uh, algebraic uh, is actually a sub bundle of uh, this E infinity analytic outside the code dimension two set. So based on this, we can conclude that our E infinity analytic is actually the double deal of some algebraic ones. At the same time, because of this relation, we know that this algebraic limit is not so bad. It's a torsion free and semi stable shape. So the limit we get in the code scheme is uh, well behaved. That's a point. So after this point, uh, we transform our problem into a uh, algebraic geometric problem for which the conclusion is already known. Okay, so on the algebraic side, the limits can be actually read off from Grab and Thomas results on compactification of modular space of semi stable shifts. So they construct a modular space and mu SS. Uh, this compactifies the um, space of semi stable shifts over projective manifolds uh, with given numerical class and a fixed determinant. The point is you have a map from the uh, semi stable shifts in the code scheme to this modular space. Using this map, uh, in our case, if, you, if we look at the sequence of elements in a code scheme, uh, through this map, actually, uh, the image inside this uh, modular space, uh, it will be a fixed point. So in particular, uh, we know that this Q infinity and QI are the same point in the modular space. Uh, the key property is that we already know this Q infinity is semi-stable. That comes from the analytical information. So Q infinity and QI are the same point in the modular space, in this modular space. And from the geometry of this, this modular space, we can conclude that this Q infinity and QI gives the same W of the gradient shift, same cycle. So in particular, we know that the analytical shift we get is a W of this gradient shift, and so does the cycle. They also coincide, okay? So yeah, so that's how we solve the problem. And after this, after you, uh, after you identify the limiting shift, the identification of this uh, blow up locus uh, follows from a single blockchain formula by Sibley and Richard. Okay. Uh, but since here we assume that uh, the restriction is semi stable. In general, uh, this can be dealt with inductively because uh, we can actually construct M such E hat, where this M will denote the number of the possible images of this D. And uh, actually this kind of, uh, uh, all those optimal tangent cones are related by special Hackey transforms. So, and you can use them to, uh, to find other factors. Okay, so that's all what I want to say. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Xiu Miao. Are there any questions?
so the analytic tangent cone never sees the different uh, Hecke modifications. I mean, the different uh, algebra, the optimal. You, so you have different optimal algebraic tangent cones, but those never get distinguished by the the analytic one, right? Get. I mean. So you mentioned that you have different. Uh, yes, you're right. So so the point is, uh, this uh, optimal ones, uh, you, you they all give you the same a uh, gradient shift and a cycle. Yes, it does not. Yeah. So do they do they, do they somehow get distinguished by again by the limits of these sections? I mean, in principle, is that what's going on? That you get, I mean, there. Uh, so in other words, you get different subsheaves of the analytic limit, uh, but they have the same uh, quotient uh, like, uh, torsion sheaf, basically. Like in that, if you after you pass to the limit, you don't really see the difference in this case. See, but, yeah. Can, but like you said, you mean if you look at the Soft shift generated by this limiting shift, right? Uh, by these limiting sections, then corresponding, you look at the difference. Right. Uh, so the limiting shift and the original shift, they they have the same graded hardener simas filtration. This one. Um, If you forget about the um, extension property, forget like use them as direct sum. Yeah. I don't see why it can like uh, make a difference. Okay. Yeah. If you if you don't have bubbling set, you always you always get direct sum, right? In this case. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but originally you can get different extension. So, it might not be able to tell the difference in this case. Anything else? All right. So if nothing, then let's take Shula Miao again for the beautiful talk. Thank you. Yeah, and really nice, really nice results as well. All right, good. So I guess see you guys. Uh, when is the next talk? In two weeks? Jacob. Uh, I think so. Is that uh, Connor Mooney or? It could be. It could be in next in two weeks anyway. Okay. Well, see you guys. <laughs> see you. Thank you, Shamiel. Thanks. Thank you very much, Shamiel.